Joining us is singer, poet, and actor Flaco Navaja, who released his new single, Cantale a la Vida, which translates in Spanish to Sing a Song to Life, a special project produced during the COVID-19 pandemic. Flaco, it's a pleasure meeting you. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to meet you as well. This past year has brought changes to everyone's life, including time for some to delve into their creative side. You immersed yourself into music. Was the single something you were working on? Or was it something that organically happened during this period? It was something that organically happened, absolutely. Um, early on during the pandemic, a, a melody popped into my head. It was as simple as that. And it was the first time that a melody came in the form of the entire song. Like it was super clear in terms of what was the verse, where was the bridge, where was the, the chorus section. And, and I just didn't have any lyrics. Um, I knew I, I knew it, it was a, a, an organic response to what's happening and, and, the, and the need to contribute to the narrative. So uh, I eventually reached out to a good friend of mine asking for advice about songwriting and he ended up becoming my collaborator. And that's uh, my brother, Obi Bermudez, who is an amazing singer, songwriter, artist, uh, Latin Grammy winner brother as in relative or brother as in you know somebody you hold very dear and respect and trust uh, the latter yeah okay. brother <laughs> as in uh my brother from another mother hey which is still family <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely i listened to the single and the rhythm brought me back to classic like old school music with a twist because i'm listening to it i'm like oh i like this i'm hearing the clave i'm hearing the the drums and then all of a sudden I hear spoken words. I started my career as a spoken word artist. Um, my initial performance experience was, was in the open mics of the New York and Poets Cafe and, and other venues in New York City um, as a poet in the late 90s. And, um, but I always had a passion for singing. So I ended up using the poetry as a vehicle that allowed me to sing because I had a captive audience. I was on stage and I had people there listening to me. So I would sing a cappella, old school salsa tunes, um, and then recite poetry that I'd written uh, that dealt with the same themes of the songs. Have audiences reacted to that combination? Because it's unique. <laughs> it definitely set me apart at the time from uh, my peers. Um, and it, I, I just, I didn't think about it. It was kind of just what happened. I, and I, I was blessed to have started at such a young age. So it was a, as I was discovering what life was and, and, and living through a young adulthood and, and all of those struggles, I was also kind of embarking on, an, on an, uh, a professional artistic life, you know? And it all kind of came together, and and all of the uh, all of my influences came out on stage just naturally, and, and it was something that throughout the years I was able to kind of realize what was working, what wasn't, and uh, and and kind of owning who I am as an artist. You've mentioned so you've combined your love for poetry along with your love for salsa music. So what's beautiful about it is that you've entered two genres, Latinos and the American market. How, how have you handled that? And what is it like with the audiences? Because usually it's either or. You either have the American yeah. market or you have salsa lovers and Latinos. So you have a unique experience in my humble opinion. Thank you. Um, I can only be myself. So being a, a, a young, uh, being a person that grew up in the South Bronx um, and uh, from a super proud Puerto Rican family, um, salsa music has always been part of the soundtrack of my life. But so has hip hop and so has classic rock and roll. And, and, and other things that I, that I got, I'm the youngest of five. So I kind of inherited the musical tastes of my older siblings, you know? And I don't believe that it's necessary to compartmentalize it all. I think they can all coexist and they just do. And that's how it is. 
so it's been received super well and i think uh throughout it's it's what i've done throughout my career and whether it be singing a cappella salsa music in poetry shows or doing poetry in a straight up salsa song at a regular salsa gig with my with my band um so we mentioned at the beginning of our interview, this was done during COVID. And when I was listening to the single, you mentioned things like Black Lives Matter. So clearly it was, it doesn't seem like that was a coincidence. You were know. influenced by what was happening at the time. Absolutely. Um, you know, this, this year has been a difficult one to say the least. Um, it's also been an, a historic one. It's also been an exciting one in a sense of, uh, it's a time where we are seeing young people take to the streets and uh, people of all generations kind of take a stand and, and, and come together to voice their opinion, to, to, to lash, to fight for what they believe is right and to kind of show up and be counted and, and heard. And there, there. During when we're faced with difficult times, we're we're faced with a with this a, a decision. Do we go forward into the negative aspect of what what's going on and stay in our pity and wallow and 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 be angry and stay in our anger, or do we celebrate the fact that we are alive and 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 focus on the positives of 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 what's going on? And I felt the need to in this song comment on the fact that this is a what a what a time to be alive for lack of better words it's like it's amazing yeah we're in the middle of a pandemic and it's been difficult and it's a, been a long what eight months or so or something like that and also we have been dealing with four years of a difficult to, and uh president that that divided people and not unified them um but like you know the young people showed up in record number then and we have a new president-elect and there's a, a all this social change happening and and the fight is just beginning but it's a, a, an important time and i felt the need as an artist and a responsibility to comment on that and, and contribute to the narrative of this historic time. Now, beautifully said. I read something. Um, you described this single as a testament to the beauty of life, the resilience of the human spirit, and the power of un pueblo unido, a united town. I read that statement, and, I, and what came to mind was mindfulness, idealism, and someone whose perspective has been impacted by personal experiences. What's the truth behind that statement? Um, yeah. I, it's in depth. <laughs> what's that? It was definitely an in-depth statement. Thanks. I mean, it's, I, I think when I, it's interesting when we embarked on the releasing of the single and, and having to uh, think about to talk about this song or something that you created in a in, in in a way that it's almost like you're talking about it from the outside is a very interesting thing, you know. So um, when I was asked to describe the song in 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 in, in short statements, it, I feel like th th that that statement kind of sums it up because of like I mentioned earlier, these this year being a difficult and historic one. Um, it's like, yeah, we see the strength of a, of a, of, of, of un pueblo unido and it's been shown even, uh, last year, uh, when the people, young people took to the streets of Puerto Rico and, and forced their governor to resign, you know, that was a historic time and it's super inspiring and yeah, um, and we are resilient people. Like it's been an eight, a long eight months in 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 this pandemic, and I see all of people all over uh, the country dealing, and yeah, dealing because uh, they have no other choice. Unfortunately, because we don't, we didn't have a, a a president and an administration that had any way of dealing with this issue. Um, 
but like yeah seeing communities come together and and take care of each other and families and this this time has forced us to we're home now so we're yeah it's it's kind of shifted my perspective on what's important and and where physically you are how important it is to be with your family you know I found when I read, I also came across something on Facebook and I'm quoting your words. Uh, it said, I'm the son of hardcore Puerto Rican nationalists, a salsa singing follower of Jesus Christ. And when I read that statement along with the other statement, it made me think like we were in experiencing perhaps something similar. And I know and, and share with me, I'm curious, but I'm going through a period, I think, as I get older and also during the last several months of a lot of reflection and my perspective on life changing in a way that I didn't think it would. Because I have to say, I've always been pretty balanced. You know, I don't know that from my 20s to now, I'm completely different. My personalities remained about the same, you know, pretty level headed. And, but I have noticed in the last year or so, just my perspective because of past experiences, because what I'm seeing around me has changed. Does that impact what you're doing, whether it's the poetry, your music, your lyrics, do they, your sound, yeah. that change? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, when I look back at, at the, the body of work that, that, I, that I've created throughout the years, um, I started, I started writing poetry and performing poetry professionally in 1998 or so. I was about 18 years old. I'm uh, in my 40s now and uh, and have not looked back. It's like I, I'm in too deep at this point, like to, to shift and try to do something else. It's not going to happen. So, um, so I, you know, Throughout the years, my, like I said before, I'm a product of my influences. I'm also a product of my experiences. And I think the art comes from those, those places. And yeah, perspectives change. What you find important now isn't the same thing as you may have found important when you were in your 20s. And, um, and yeah, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a husband, I'm a father now. It's a, it's a different world. And that perspective of that, it's, it just adds to the, the multi-layered filter that you look at the world through, you know? I see it now as, uh, through, through different eyes because of having two little baby girls, you know? Oh. Yeah. What, were your, some of your, what were some of your musical influences growing up? Yeah, uh, so I come from a super Puerto Rican family, my father, um, his way of instilling pride in being Puerto Rican in us is by ridiculing us and saying that we weren't. And he'd be like, ah, tú no eres Puerto Rican, yo te eres americano. No, I'm not, papi, I'm Puerto Rican. You know, and uh, but so music is a big part of our family. He wasn't a musician, but he listened to a lot of music. So I may not have liked it when I was a kid. I love this music now, but in the background in our home always was playing old school like boleros, like musica romantica from um, uh, groups like Trio de los Condes and Felipe Pirela and Odilio Gonzalez and a lot of uh, mountain Puerto Rican music, jibaro music from Las Montañas and things like Ramito and, and, uh, and Odilio Gonzalez. So listening to, so that was in the background always. I had an uncle who, was, who went to Vietnam, came home and was a mad salsero, New Yorican, you know, a uh, big influence on me, my uncle Maximino, um, politician, uh, activist, community activist, all of, all of these things. So he was the mad salsero. So that was also a, a, another layer in, in, in that early on I was drawn to without knowing necessarily why there was something about the sound, the, 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 the rhythms and the, and the voices. Um, I was very early on drawn to, to salsa music or by, the ten, by like 10 years old, which comes where I got the name Flaco Navaja. I'll let you know about that in a second. I'll remember. Um, so that was, that was in the, in the thing. But like I said before, I'm the youngest of five. 
So at one point I was, I don't know, early on as well, 10 years old, around that same time, my sister, uh, one of my older sister goes away to college. I inherit her room and uh, being the nosy kid I was, I'm looking through all this stuff. I find a box of cassette tapes. And in this, in this box of cassette tapes was this random eclectic mix of music um, from the best of the doors to uh, the, the soundtrack of the Woodstock um, documentary. That's where I got my love for classic rock and roll and like Janis Joplin and all of these type of people, Jimi Hendrix and, and Santana and uh, that kind of stuff. Um, then she also had like the soundtrack to the movie A Clockwork Orange, which was all classical music. And I remember her at one point asking her to see that movie. And she was like, absolutely not. You can't watch that movie. It's so, such a violent, crazy uh, Stanley Kubrick film. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I was this kid that loved, like, I couldn't go to sleep without playing The Best of the Doors. It was one of those things that I just did. So though all those voices kind of marinated in this warped brain of mine that and that's who I am now but the the intro to like salsa yeah one of the first songs um that I sang in front of people and kind of got a reaction that showed me that, that I was on to something per se um I was in a family gathering and there was a song there's a, there is a song called Todos Vuelven and I believe, I'm not sure if Ruben Blades wrote it, but I, I heard that song for the first time in a, the soundtrack of a film called Crossover Dreams that he did. And, um, and he's, uh, it's a film where he's playing like a pop singer trying to cross over to an American market. And his mentor is this old school salsa singer named Vigilio Malti, who's a brilliant voice. And I love his voice so much. Um, and there's a scene where Ruben's kind of playing his pop music to the guy and, and the guy's like, turn it off, man. You got to play this and starts playing the clave with two pencils and he sings a song, Todos Welping. And I love that song. It's one of the first songs I ever learned. And I sang that song in front of my family and like my uncle's wife starts crying and it, it was just this, this experience. And, and then that kind of went, that's when I started going down the rabbit hole of of salsa music and listening to all Ruben Blade stuff. And then, and then for some reason got put on to Hector Lavoe and that was it. And he was kind of like my main influence coming up. And uh, yeah, and I, but I always kind of had this other musical rhythm under, you know, this whole other side of me that, and, and what's funny, if I, I don't know, I'm kind of going off on a tangent, but not that much. What's funny to me is that I feel like salsa music is, salsa music has always been to me like hip hop. Like they, they were one in the same. And it, and it has to do with the fact that they were both born out of struggle in communities that were mixed. They were both um, uh, the soundtrack of the times for people. They are the commentary. They follow the long traditions of telling the story of the people that haven't had their voice heard. Um, and, and even like musically hip hop drew from all these sources, you know? So like, I remember hearing a uh, uh, Cheo Feliciano song, El Raton with the Fania All-Stars live in Yankee Stadium. I wasn't there, but I saw a, a video. And the bass line is like, doom, 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 doom. and that to me just felt like a hip hop song. And I was like, that made me go further into, into like salsa and my love for it and, and feeling a license to be a practitioner of it. Yeah, sorry, I went off for, for a while there. No, no, not at all. I, I got excited just listening to it and I, I can relate in many respects. You talked about all these different interests that you have. You are also an ensemble member of the Paragones Puerto Rican Traveling Theater, which has brought to mind the Fania All-Stars. Um, you were talking about your, like, your influences and in growing up. I know that with, with myself, my father enjoyed listening to, to numerous uh, musicians. 
and the Fania All Stars, I know it was definitely something I was hearing around the house. They were, for those viewers that may not be familiar with the Fania All Stars, they were a musical group that was formed in the late 60s. Yeah. Why do you think that comparison exists? I think um, the Fania All Stars created music during a time that there was a lot going on um, politically, socially, in our communities. Um, and that's what made their music stand the test of time. And also they were all just amazing. I mean, the fact that they were called all stars is not take, to be taken lightly. They were each stars in their own right. Um, for me to draw a comparison to them, I don't think it's uh, earned or warranted just yet, but um, I, I am directly influenced by them. I do stand on their shoulders and in, in, in as an artist and come from that school. So yeah, I am a student of that and I do, I do feel like I, um, yeah, I just, I'm striving to tell my story and tell the stories of those that um, I feel are underrepresented. Tell us more about your involvement with the Pregones Puerto Rican Traveling Theater Company. Absolutely, the Pregones, uh, Pregones Puerto Rican Traveling Theater Company. So these are, Pregones is a, a theater company that was born in the Bronx so about 40 years ago, and they are an ensemble-based company that creates theater normally based off of what they do. Their, their aesthetic is that they take pieces of Puerto Rican literature that weren't necessarily meant for the stage and adapt it to the stage using music and all different type, uh, types of techniques. Um, and they have a long history and they are amazing. It's an honor to be a part of their, their ensemble. Now, the Puerto Rican Traveling Theater was a company founded by a Puerto Rican legend actor named Miriam Colón. And Miriam Colón is an, uh, one of our icons and um, may she rest in peace. And she founded this theater company uh, also maybe 40 to 50 years ago in, in the heart of Broadway section in Manhattan. And, um, and it's been around for, for that long and the only Spanish language and Latino theater in that area for a long time as well. And she, uh, so they eventually merged the two companies and now there's this, these two companies have merged and we have two spaces, one in the Bronx, one in Manhattan where we are able to produce amazing work and so, yeah, so it's an honor to be a part of that ensemble. And that company, they also very recently produced and helped me develop my first ever one man show, a theater show called Evolution of a Sonero, where I talk about my life and sing songs with a salsa band. You, you, you said what I was thinking, because that was going to be my next question. I was going to say, I know that you displayed on the theater stage this particular production, and it was sold out earlier this year. Yeah. Describe the play to our viewers, and can we expect to see it in the future? Absolutely. Well, the plan is to definitely, it, it, the, the show itself has legs, so to speak. So yeah, we're, we're, we're looking to, to continue to share it wherever we can. Um, and Evolution of Osonero is a show where I, I take the, I explain, the structure of a salsa song and use that structure as a metaphor for my life. Intro, verse, things like that. So it's monologues, it's a love letter to the Bronx, it's a love letter to salsa, um, and it's a coming of age story. It's, yeah, it's funny and, and, and dramatic and it's my life, it's my life up to this point with, uh, with the help of a kick-ass salsa band. Yeah. Would I say it's fair to say that your roots in the Bronx have impacted you and everything that you do? Absolutely, absolutely. It's the sound. It's it's the one of the soundtracks of my life, and um, 
coming from the Bronx with such a rich history that the Bronx has of art and, 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 and the history that it has of salsa music and, and, and struggle and resilience, it's, uh, it's, a set, it's a source of pride. It's, um, it's one of those things like, you know, I'm like, super proud of being Puerto Ricano and I'll be, I'll, I'll consider myself Puerto Rican before I consider myself American before I consider myself anything else, right? And then before I consider myself American, I'm a New Yorker, you know what I mean? <laughs> and then, and, and more importantly, I'm from the Bronx, you know? So it's, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's who I am. It informs a lot of who I am. I can relate because people will ask me, where are you from? And I'll say, nationality? Where I was born? <laughs> so it's a complex question. <laughs> Because similar to you, my family's from Colombia. I was born here, but if you ask me, I'm Colombian. And I will, I will have people that will say to me, no, then you're American. And I said, well, I mean, technically, but my family's from Colombia. My culture, I mean, everything I identify with is Colombian. Am I proud to be American? Of course. But similar to you. And if you want to get technical about it. The, the United States aren't all of America, you know what I mean? Colombian is American, so it's, so it's Puerto Rican if you want to talk about it, you know? Sometimes, the, like the, the arrogance of, of this culture to, to say that this is America only and exclude the entire continent is, is, is crazy. You're absolutely right. You mentioned early on uh, your affiliation with the New York Poets Cafe. Mm -hmm. And I want our viewers to know all about you because I'm so excited about you. You are also part of HBO's Deaf Poetry Jam. Share with us your experiences with them. And I think I and our viewers at this point already have a sense that the poetry and the salsa music, definitely the two blend for you. Because I, I wanted to initially ask you, what's the difference? Like, who are you as the poet and who are you as the salsa singer? But I get the feeling that you blend the two. Yeah, absolutely, I do. Um, so my, my history at the New Yorican Poets Cafe is, uh, the, for those of you that may not know, the New Yorican Poets Cafe is a le uh, legendary venue in New York City in the Lower East Side on 3rd Street between Avenue B and C. And it's, it was the, it's the home of a literary movement that came out during the late 60s, 70s called the New York Poetry Movement. And um, there, this was a lot uh, uh, happening along the side of the Black Arts Movement that was happening at the time. And it was a response, like I said, art tends to flourish under, I didn't say this, but uh, <laughs> well now, but uh, art tends to flourish under oppressive regime or, or the struggle comes out of this, a, a lot of this art, right? So the 70s were no different. And uh, the New Rican poets were, yeah, the, the, I come from the same way that I said earlier that I came from the school of the Fania All-Stars, I come from the school of the legendary New Rican poets like the Reverend Pedro Pietri, um, Mikey Pinero, Miguel Pinero, uh, Miguel Algarín, Sandra Maria Estevez and uh, uh, Jose Jesus Papoleto Melendez, amongst others, I'm sure I'm missing a bunch, Tato La Viera. So um, these people had this space where they did poetry and theater and music and all of these things, and it's been around for, for all these years. So as a young person first starting out, that's the place you're gonna go. You have to, if you, you can't call yourself a poet in New York City and not have done poetry at the New York Rican Poets Cafe. It's just not a, it's not allowed. So I was a kid that I would go down there with no money, um, lie to the guy at the door, say I needed to use the bathroom or, or say that I was one of the featured artists and, and sneak in. And eventually he already knew and he just let me in. I was, Cause for it to be called the New York Rican Poets Cafe at the time during the 90s, there was a bit of a shift in terms of like the people going there, the, the it, you know, I, I was this wide eyed kid thinking that I'm going to go to the New York Rican and see these legends hanging out there still. But at this point, it was a it was a little different kind of a, it was more of a scene. So there was like, you know, uh, NYU college students looking for a good time, that type of thing. 
Um, so I, I was a little disillusioned, but not enough to stop me from going. But with that said, I was part of a small crop of like young New Yorkans. You know what I mean? I was part of this next generation that was coming up. So eventually, yeah, the doorman just kind of would let me in and and I eventually started uh, and I eventually inherited an open mic where I became the host and, and, and hosted this open mic poetry, hip hop and jazz show for, for many years. And that was my training ground. So deaf poetry comes around uh, in, in, in the year, maybe 2001 or two, 2003 or four. And by that time, there was a vibrant spoken word scene in New York City and all of the other major cities. LA had, had a vibrant spoken word scene, Chicago, Atlanta, all these spots, they, they, they were doing it. So when Deaf Poetry comes around, it was the first time that we're all exposed to each other and the regions and, and spoken word was exposed to the world in a large uh, way. Um, so one of my best friends, was one of the original cast members of Deaf Poetry. His name is Lemon, Lemon Anderson. He's my favorite writer and uh, he's an amazing writer and also performer. And so he was one of the original cast members. They were one of the first people that they called to be on the show. The, the show was an HBO series that featured artists from all over the country and internationally as well, and also had celebrities perform. Eventually that show, they created a Tony Award winning Broadway version of it. And that, my friend Lemon was one of the original cast members of that. And he was always an advocate for me and had always been like, oh, you, you need to have my boy Flacco here. Like, there's no reason why, blah, 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 all this stuff. So eventually they called me to be a part of the, a, a part of the TV show. I did a couple of episodes, um, including uh, uh, one poem that I did with Lemon and it's called Boricuas, which is uh, uh, people, it, it had been shared uh, millions of times on Facebook or whatever. Um, and so I did a couple of episodes and then eventually that Broadway show did a t an international tour. So who would have thought, I, I definitely not me, I would never have imagined that when I first signed up for this poetry open mic that first time that I'd be traveling the world performing my poetry. And we went to New Zealand, we went to Australia, we spent a month in Scotland during the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. And then we also did an, a, a national tour of all these regional theaters and it was a huge experience. It was an amazing experience for me. Um, uh, and it was also during a, 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 a highly politically charged time during um, when jo George uh, Bush was in office. So here I am traveling all over the country and internationally with a eclectic uh, international group of, uh, uh, of poets, nine poets and a DJ and, and we were speaking our truth and that was a powerful experience to do that all over. And then also for me personally, traveling so much gave me a, a newfound perspective about where I was from and a newfound appreciation of being from the Bronx and, it, and, 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 and those type of things. So it was a very, that, that experience with deaf poetry and traveling with them all over was a huge, huge learning ground. I mean, I, like I said, I fell into this artistic life at a young age, at the age of like 18. So. I truly am a student of the university of life because everything that I've learned up until this point has been on the job training. You know, I, I didn't go to art school. I didn't go to music school or, or, or graduate with a degree or a MFA or anything like a lot of my colleagues have. Um, but I learned from them and, and everyone else that, I, that I've, that I've had the, the honor to collaborate with and work with. What do you hope people take away from this single, your musical sound and your poetry? Um, I, I want people to recognize this, feel the sound is familiar and also new. Um, I want them to uh, feel a sense of hope that, that that, uh, you know, a change gonna come soon and uh, that, that we can, we, 
been through so much and we'll continue uh, that, but we will survive and we will continue to, to thrive. And, 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 and we just have to hold on to, to our faith, hold on to hope and also to each other. And, and this, 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 somos mas. We're more at, uh, when we're united, we are more than, than the negative. We just thought. Well, I always want our guests to feel welcomed. <laughs> you talked about a cappella. That's how you got your start in front of a family gathering. So now I'm going to make a request <laughs> in front of our viewers. And I, I want you to feel comfortable. I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot. I've already shared with you that I happen to have a love for music as well. <laughs> ah, <nice. laughs> okay. With that said, can we get you to do a little a cappella right now? Absolutely. So this song, uh, this is Cantale la Vida. Um, the, the, the single. It was written by myself and Obi Bermudez, and the musical arrangement was done by a, a brother by the name of Oscar Hernandez. Oscar Hernandez was part of Ruben Blade Seis del Solal, and he's also the, the band leader and, and composer and arranger of Spanish Harlem Orchestra, like multi Grammy winning people. And they blessed me with this, this collaboration. So I, I feel important always to to give credit when credit's due so this is cantale a la vida sing a song to life necesitamos amor aunque sea de lejitos necesitamos cariño pa proteger los niñitos anoche soñé contigo soñé que yo te abrazaba Y que el tiempo no sobraba, que no nos faltaba nada. Canta corazón, ay pulmón respira, abre tu balcón y cántale a la vida. Canta corazón, ay pulmón respira. Vita la esperanza y hace un armonía. I be the son of hardcore South Bronx Puerto Rican nationalist. An aguinaldo bomba y plena salsa rumba singing actor activist. Llevo el swing del sur del Bronx wherever I go. From the Seine in Paris to old San Juan's callejones. See, I was raised on a steady diet of Rapi Levi La Selecta. KRS One, The Doors, Bob Marley, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, y Musica de Protesta. I am the tree that grew from the seed planted by Ruben and Willie so many years ago. Siembra. I am Juana Peña and Pedro Navaja's illegitimate child. I am salsa. I am hip hop. I am Puerto Rico. I am the South Bronx. I am New York City. My name is Flaco Navaja. Thank you so much was awesome. I felt like I had my own personal concert. <laughs> Thank you. I am I am truly honored and I know that uh, this is will, this will mean quite a lot to our viewers. And it is it's this beautiful sound. I could see had you, had someone shared with me you can combine spoken word, hip hop and salsa, I would have thought no. <laughs> And then you did it so beautifully and so seamlessly because you were, you were doing your, your rhythm and I thought, oh, this is so nice. And then all of a sudden you got serious on me and I was like, oh, cool. And then it's like you, you it just added on to it. It didn't take away from it, which Thank I thought you. was awesome. Yeah, I think they could all coexist. I think a lot of times, um, you know, one thing that I always did, never wanted to do was, and this is just my personal preference and style in, in, in terms of my attack, I, I, I always wanted to maintain the integrity of the, of the rhythm that I established in the beginning. And 
didn't want, didn't feel like I didn't want to go from a salsa tune and all of a sudden hear like this hip hop beat in the background and to, in order to me, for me to rap. I just enjoyed being able to speak over the salsa rhythm or whatever rhythm is there. And that comes from the training that I had at the New York Poets Cafe where uh, it, the show that we hosted was an open mic that had poets and rappers come on stage with a three-piece jazz band and they were ne no one was allowed to do a acapella. So the, the music was completely improvised on the spot at the, at the time, yeah, right then, then, then and there. So that taught me so much in terms of the musicality of poetry and the possibilities of when you have an open mind, how you can ch uh, change your approach to, to the expression of it all. Moving forward, what do you see for the future? What are projects that you still want to work on or artists that perhaps you want to collaborate with? Oof, I have a list. Um, well, you know, I, I, I still maintain the dream of, of, of collaborating with my musical mentor, Ruben Blades. I, I've, I've had the, the, the honor of sharing the stage with him and singing a, a song with him live at the Lincoln Center. And, um, but uh, yeah, I'd love, to, I'd love to either record a song that he wrote specifically or, or, or collaborate on a song together. I'd love that. Um, and yeah, in terms of what's next, I want to continue to create. I think um, if we're not able to do live performances, then we have to do something. So um, that's something that I want to continue to to record and, and, and release some more material. And then when things open up again, uh, get back to sharing uh, Evolution of a Sonero and, uh, and yeah, maybe uh, starting to uh, continue to create the, the next solo show that I'm kind of marinating in my in my head. Flaco, continue marinating <laughs> because you're marinating these beautiful flavors and it has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for sharing your talent, sharing your story with myself, with our viewers. Uh, just continued success. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure very much and uh, yeah. You can find me, your viewers can find me on social media, uh, Flaco Navaja at uh, Gmail. I mean, uh, yeah, Flaco Navaja at Gmail at uh, Instagram, Facebook, and things like that. Um, also, the song Cantale a la Vida is, is available now on all uh, streaming platforms, Amazon, iTunes, Apple Music, YouTube Music, all of those things. Share it, please. Find it, share it, comment it, comment on it, and uh, yeah. Thanks so much. I will definitely be doing that. Viewers, make sure you share and view.